We are tracking Hurricane Douglas, still a Category 1 hurricane, and we have our resident, well, our hurricane expert. Uh, we have Dr. Allison Nugent, uh, who joins us again with some insight into maybe just general questions and what she sees with the latest on tracking Douglas. Hi, Allison Nugent. How are you doing? Hello. Thanks again for having me back. I really appreciated the analysis you did in the last segment with Gina, where you showed that the storm was tracking more northwesterly. That really made me feel a lot better. Oh, right on, right on. Good to hear. Um, okay, so do you mind if we jump right into uh, the uh, radar shot? Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put the radar shot, the latest on this, and I, I just have a question for you. Gina noticed uh, in the radar shot that. Um, the southern, I guess the southern edge of the eye, the, you know, I would say the southeast to southwest quadrant started to fall apart and is kind of mm -hmm. void of convection. And, and here it is right here. Is that just, uh, you think, a normal cycle that will, that will rebuild? Or do you think it's a sign possibly of uh, a beginning of an increased rate of weakening? Uh I'd say it's a little bit hard to say. When you look at the satellite image, it's all cloud filled. So the fact that there's no rain there hopefully means that it's it's falling apart. Oftentimes you see dry air mixing into storms as they start to fall apart. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't expect the dry air to necessarily be on that side. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that with sheared storms, the strongest part with the most convection and, and by the way when I say the word convection I mean I mean clouds precipitation air moving vertically thunderstorms that's those are kind of all synonymous with each other and so that area with the orangey red that's mm -hmm. the the northern side of the storm and that's likely to have the most convection because of the southerly wind shear the southerly winds winds from south to north at high levels I so, see. okay i see yeah, so, so it's, there, it's there, not surprising that the most of the precipitation is on that side mm -hmm. and the least amount is on the other side because of the wind shear okay which is uh, generally from the southwest generally yeah although i think in the discussions for this storm the cphc has said that the shear is primarily southerly mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some pretty, pretty heavy rain, pretty good convection up here. Let's take a look at the, uh, uh, the rainfall rates or the precip rates at, at the darkest returns. We're seeing 2.21 inches per hour. That's only a small, tiny chunk, though. Um, that's where it's raining heaviest right now. And off to the side, off to the left side of the storm, the west side, it's 1.34. But, you know, the greens that we're seeing much lighter, uh, you know, overall rainfall rates no no surprises there yeah yeah no surprises there the other thing that strikes me about this is that as the storm is moving away from the molokai radar and may not be able to be picked up as well by the south point radar as it moves into the the location where the terrain blocks the beams what we're seeing is just the top part of the storm and so the rain rates may be underestimated because we're not able to scan with the radar the full vertical profile of the storm okay so that that slight more uh, northwesterly jog that that we were talking about earlier that may be the upper levels of the storm but that not that that not that doesn't particularly mean it's the lower levels of the storm, which is the primary steering component of the hurricane. Yeah, it may be. It's, it's, um... Okay. It, yeah, it's a little bit hard to tell, but I, I, that's my intuition when I look at it. I think, oh, it's kind of far from Molokai, and it's about to be blocked by the terrain from the yeah. radar on Kauai. Okay, okay. Uh, anything else uh, that you wanted to add? I think you wanted to do a uh, historical uh, kind of track for uh, Douglas. Yeah, I was hoping to share my screen so that I could, so that we could have a look at the Central Pacific Hurricane Center track okay. through time. All right. So I'll do that now. Are you got this? Um, I wanted to look at the one that I have, if that's all right. Okay, yeah, go for it. Okay, so this graphic, this is my computer, this is the graphic from the Central Pacific Hurricane Center website. And what you can do is you can move it through time. So this is the same cone of uncertainty that we've been talking about. And you can see, um, maybe I'll 
stop it at one point. So here, the H means hurricane strength. It was initially forecast to weaken to a tropical storm. Um, at this point, the forecast was kind of driven by the ECMWF that was going more southerly and the GFS that was going more northerly. Um, but overall, what I, what I see when I look at this, and I'm, I'll play it again, is that, you know, the, the forecast was pretty spot on throughout the whole lifetime of the storm. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll initiate again. And so you never know whether the storm will take the more northern route or the southern route, but it's the eye is likely to stay within that bound, and it has. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to, to emphasize that because I think it's something that often gets missed. And we'll stop on this last one just to show that Kauai still is within this cone of uncertainty, but like you showed, it looks like the storm may be making more of a kind of northwesterly track. Uh, one other point I wanted to make, if I back up a bit, oh, um, I'll just play it again and then stop where I want. Um, so there's been some really interesting discussion on the tropical storm listserv that I'm on. There's a lot of people commenting that this is one of the one of the times where the GFS model, the Global Forecast System model, the US model, is has outperformed the European ECMWF model. And so I just wanted to throw that in there as something that is potentially of interest to people. Mm. It's um it's great to see our our model working well. Right, right, right. Go go GFS. Um do, do yes. you do you know if, um, and I was going to ask somebody at the, uh, the National Weather Service, do you know if that GFS upgrade has been fully implemented and if that was actually used with forecasting this one? I'm not sure if it's actually all out, rolled out now. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'd have to check with someone there. Yeah, because it was, it was a few months back where, uh, or maybe six months, uh, almost maybe a year back where they said that they had that upgrade and they're kind of beta testing it and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm wondering if it was fully operational uh, at this point. So I'll try to get that answer. And speaking of answers and questions, would you like to field some? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I just got to scroll through, uh, through the emails. Um, and there's some, by the way, the questions that, uh, that have been given to us have been very, very good questions, and we both appreciate uh, people emailing us. <laughs> and if you have a question, you can certainly email us, news at khon2.com. Okay. Uh, regarding, this is from Craig, regarding the travel of storms, we have seen Douglas move quite steadily, though not exactly as predicted in strength, from the eastern Pacific westward. A few years back, we saw many storms travel across the Pacific, and some that missed us south and kept going all the way across the Pacific, some breaking up and reforming a few times likely. Some of these storms being typhoons affecting the Western Pacific nations such as Guam, Saipan, Philippines, and Taiwan. When Douglas leaves our area with the oddly warm waters and stubbornness of Douglas, what is the likelihood we could see him trudge across the Pacific and affect the Western Pacific nations? Okay. <laughs> that was a, a very long detailed way. question. Yeah. Um, and so uh, thus far, I, I suppose if I, oh, or can you show it on yours? I was going to say if I had kept my graphic up, I could show you here. But the, the forecast tracks are showing it kind of curving more northerly after it leaves the Hawaiian Islands. And so I don't think there's any chance that this storm will affect the mm. Western Pacific. Okay. I, yeah, I, are you able to? Yeah, you have it there. Great. Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to think back. Um, and I think the... The nearest thing to that would be a tropical system that crossed the international date line and started heading to Japan and became a subtropical system, more like a, just a low pressure system instead of like a tropical system that requires uh, latent heat from the ocean. Now it's just like a low that you would see in Japan, uh, dumping rain and then it jetted off uh, to the higher latitudes and eventually probably brought some wet weather to the U.S. West Coast. That's the only, I don't, I don't think, recall I've ever seen a tropical system make it uh, into the West Pacific like that. Because you made an interesting point earlier, the, at least in the Northern Hemisphere and the East Pacific, these storms like to move west and they like to move north. Yeah, and once they move north, they move over cooler waters. And so 
you you gave an example where a tropical storm, which is driven by latent heating from evaporation of warm sea surface temperatures, um, where that kind of a system transitions to what's called an extra tropical storm mm -hmm. or a, a regular low pressure system. And it's interesting because the, the dynamics of those two things are completely different. They may look kind of similar, but the fuel for the storm is very different. Tropical storms are driven by warm waters. Um, Mid-latitude cyclones are driven by the temperature difference between the equator to the pole. And so it's a completely different fuel source. It would be like if your car suddenly started running on a different fuel source, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, apparently, like you can make that transition, but um, usually with tropical systems, once they lose their fuel source, which is the, the warm ocean temperatures, they fall apart and they're not able to continue moving westward. Okay. Sounds great. Great answer. Uh, another question here, and I'm going to put up the satellite shot. Uh, do, 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 and then I'm just going to try and um, kind of do a big picture situation here. Uh, so we have a global satellite right here. And a viewer asks, is there a way for a hurricane or a tropical storm to move from the northern hemisphere into the southern hemisphere, like go, you know, from Mexico and then eventually make it down to Australia, maybe Tahiti, Fiji, that kind of situation. Okay, so the short answer is no. And the reason is because there's a number of ingredients that are needed for tropical storms. One, we talk a lot about this, um, you know, latent heating and moisture and heat, but the other really important ingredient is the Coriolis force. And the Coriolis force is an apparent force that comes from the rotation of Earth. And in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, that force points in opposite directions. And at the equator, the Coriolis force is zero. And so you can only have tropical storms like hurricanes or typhoons, you can only have them form usually outside of about five degrees latitude of the equator. They can't form at the equator. They can't even really form at two or three degrees north or south. Mm. And um, but kind of the further north you go, the stronger the Coriolis force is. And that balances the pressure gradient force, which is from the low pressure in the center and the high pressure everywhere else. So, so there's those two forces that end up balancing each other and allow for this super balanced state. You know, hurricanes are amazing because they're, they're, they're so crazy and abnormal, and yet they're a perfectly stable system in the atmosphere forces balance out and that's why they're able to maintain their structure and get so strong mm -hmm. and so without the Coriolis force like at the equator with it being zero you can't get a tropical storm there yeah you need that spin for sure uh, did you want to quickly mention about pressure versus wind speed yeah sure one of the viewers wrote in asking about um, you know what's up with low pressure systems and with wind speed and so you could basically make a make a chart. <laughs> Again, this would be a great time to have a whiteboard. But you could make a chart of wind speed versus pressure, and you find that the stronger wind speeds in hurricanes are found when you have lower central pressure. Okay. But the question the viewer asked was that oh, but it maintained its th this this storm in particular, Hurricane Douglas, maintained its strength in wind speed while its central pressure increased a bit. And they were trying to figure out why. And I'd say, while it is a kind of a linear relationship between, you know, stronger storms with stronger wind speeds have lower pressures, it's not exactly linear. There's some some wiggle room about that one to one line. Is it and mostly so, is it mostly linear? Uh, Ninety percent maybe. But that correlation. Yeah. So. So I started looking up some plots because I was interested in this question. And, and what you see is a, a fair bit of scatter, but if you fit a line to those points, the line looks linear. It's just there's some scatter around it. Okay. And so it is possible for you know a storm to weaken a bit in terms of pressure but maintains, maintain its wind strength. But if one starts to change, you know the other one's going to change soon. It may have just been kind of measurements not at the same place at the same time or something like that. Okay. Um, next question. Are, are, are you satisfied with that? You're, okay. All right. Next I'm question. I'm satisfied. I hope the viewers are. <laughs> <laughs> weather, what would Joe call it? Weather, weather 201, right? 
One step above 101. Okay, um, this is from Sherry of Honolulu. She says, please help us understand convection as it relates to cyclones. And for that, I'm going to pop up the radar image here. Uh, is convection just a circular wind? No, so that, that's actually what motivated me to mention convection earlier was the same question from Sherry. Because so to me, I use the word convection so much, and I'm sorry that I use such technical language. But um, so there's two types of heat transfer. One is conduction. That's like if you touch a metal pan and it's hot, it's transferring the heat through the metal. And the other is convection. Convection is the way that heat is transferred in a fluid. So when you boil water on the stove, you have convection in your stove. And so that's the same thing that we see in the atmosphere. We see warm air rising and as it rises, forming clouds and precipitation. So when I say convection, I'm referring to this process of heat transfer but it's kind of synonymous with saying clouds or saying thunderstorms or saying precipitation because all of those are things that result from convection in the atmosphere. And uh, a follow-up con convection is, wait, hang on. Ah, I switched the emails. Uh, anything you want to, anything you want to add to the convection to wrap up with the convection? And by the way, we, we see convection um, when over Hawaii sometimes when we don't have trade winds and we have very very light and variable winds and Kona winds in the afternoon it starts getting cloudy and then you have these sometimes explosive thunderstorms or real heavy downpours that's a good example of a convection on more of a day-to-day -day basis correct yeah I think um so convection is kind, of, is kind of one of these catch-all terms like yes thunderstorms or the deep convection that you refer to is convection but even the trade winds that we the, the the trade wind cumulus clouds that we see so any clouds that you see that have puffy ragged boundaries those are convective clouds they're clouds from convection anytime you see clouds that are kind of gray and you know everything just looks like <laughs> like there's no stratification it just looks gray those are stratiform clouds they're kind of layered clouds and so those are the two main types of clouds stratiform and cumulus so just just the cumulus clouds the trade cumulus clouds that you see every day those are examples of convection it's heat mixing upwards in the atmosphere okay uh, this is I think this is a great question by the way um, and, I, and I need to uh, sorry, once again, I need to get a satellite shot because this is more of a situation that is happening in the mainland. You know, there was talking about, uh, you know, Hannah, tropical depression, Hannah, uh, which I believe was once was uh, category one. What happened to my satellite? Okay. Okay, here we go. So the question um, from Francis is the following. Is it, what's the possibility that we could see Hannah, or Tropical Depression Hannah, reform in the East Pacific after crossing Mexico and actually travel into the Central Pacific. And let me, let me just with, like, move the uh, satellite all the way to the remnants of Hannah, which is approximately this uh, thunder, this blob that you see right here. So what's the chance that we had a system in the Gulf of Mexico, it moves over land, survives, and moves out into the East Pacific and actually makes it into the Central Pacific. So I can make you feel better to say that there's no chance of that. Uh, when a storm moves over land, it loses its fuel, it loses that source of moisture from the ocean. And so once Hannah starts to fall apart and, and decay and die, it'll move northward and get caught up with the, the westerly winds at mid-latitudes. And so there's no chance that that will happen for Henna. I have seen some cases where uh, storms kind of closer to uh, Panama or the yeah. southern Central, Central America mm -hmm. kind of do do something like that. So it's not a crazy question. Um, but with Hannah, that's not going to happen. Um, I think those storms that are closer, further down south, they're in the place where they have more warm water mm -hmm. and 
And it's not necessarily the same storm, but it's maybe like the disturbance. So when we talk about convection, like c convection or thunderstorms are how tropical storms are born. That's how hurricanes are born. Mm -hmm. And so kind of the remnants of one could lead to the formation of another, say, but it wouldn't necessarily be the same storm. And it's not very common at all. I mm -hmm. think that's why you've probably not heard about it. Oh, Dr. News, I do remember uh, many, many years ago a situation where we had a Gulf of Mexico tropical system, and it, I want to say that it was, you know, it, like went through the Yucatan, and then at that point it kind of regenerated in the southern waters of the Gulf of Mexico, near Mexico, and, and crossed over, completely fizzled, okay? But I guess that remnant moisture moved out into the East Pacific, and I believe they gave it uh, a different name. And I, I only recall that ever happening once, and I was like, "Wow, this is this is a little bit this is a little bit different." But it was many many years ago. I don't think I agree with you. I don't think it would happen if it was like up with Hannah, because there's just so much land to cover, and the thing might dissipate even further. But like, you're, like you said, maybe where there's not a lot of land to cross, maybe even in other locations where there's a quick traversal over land and then back into the water for that fuel to happen. Um, I, I agree with you on that. It's, it's fairly, fairly rare for that to happen. Yeah, Hannah's too far north also. All right. Yeah. Uh, another question. Here we go. Um, Given the current position of the hurricane, would you say with any certainty that we avoided the rain and the flooding for Honolulu, Ala Moana area? Let's just, uh, you know what, let's just do o Oahu as a whole. With, with, with what you know right now at 948 and what you see on the radar, do you think that, uh, what are the chances of any kind of flooding rain for Oahu? Yeah, personally, me, I'm breathing a sigh of relief. When this morning I was talking to, to Kelly Simic, and I was so worried that those rain bands, you know, that, that heavy rainfall that's right around the eye of Hurricane Douglas, I was so worried that that would move over Oahu, even if it didn't make landfall. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness we didn't see that. What we are seeing, or we, what we've seen over the last few hours, are kind of those lingering outer, I don't know if you want to call them outer rain bands, maybe kind of convergence regions in that southerly flow that's coming up behind the storm. And we talked about this last hour too, about as the storm moves past, the winds turn from the south and it's kind of, sometimes it's called the tail of the hurricane. And yeah, you have the arrows up there, great. Um, so that's, the, the hurricane is literally pulling up moisture from the equatorial region, which is warmer and has higher humidity. So that can lead to those showers that that come along after the fact. But from the way the radar looks right now, it looks like we're, I, I, I don't wanna say we're in the clear because hurricane environments are very convective and you can have storms pop up. So I would not be surprised to continue to see rainfall through the night. But I think in terms of the high intensity, super heavy rainfall that we were worried about earlier, I don't see a high chance of that happening. Okay, let me add a footnote to that. Compared to four hours ago, we're in a better situation now. How's that? Is that fair? Yeah, that's definitely fair. Okay. Are you ready for the lightning round, Dr. Nuge? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I challenge you to answer these questions with no more than three sentences. Are you ready? All right, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Why do tropical storms and hurricanes tend to move north? That is from Steve. Um... This is hard because I'm trying to think about <laughs> sentences, and I already wasted one. Um, they tend to move north due to something called the beta plane effect. So it has something to do with the rotation of Earth and the Coriolis force. If you spin a top on a rotating plane, it'll curve towards the north. That's a terrible answer. No, 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 no. It's absolutely scientifically correct. <laughs> it just took 10 sentences. You violated the rule. All right, number two. What determines where a storm tracks? The pressure system that drive the lower and mid-level winds. 
Hey, you actually did. All right. I'm, I'm proud of you. Okay, I'm proud I was of trying you. to zip my mouth <laughs> shut, not to say another sentence. Okay. Actually, you know what? We're we're good. Um, we're good with that. I will I will ask you one more question that's non hurricane related. What two factors cause rainbows? This was in a test that she gave that I took in her class, and I got the answer. It was the only answer out of 10 questions that I got. So anyways, what's the answer? <laughs> so, it's, so it's really easy, <laughs> rainbow. You need raindrops, and you need sun, sunlight. I mean, I mean, sorry, what, um, when the light is, you know? Um, are you asking about the angle? Rainbow. Or, Maybe I got the answer wrong. Reflection and refraction? Oh, what happens inside? So inside of the raindrop, you have reflection and refra okay. refraction. Yeah. I thought you were asking what two ingredients I, no, were no, needed no. to make I a asked, rainbow. I asked you the wrong question. Therefore, <laughs> that's totally my fault. Hey, thank you so much, um, Dr. Nuge. We're going to hear from you. Um, uh, oh, gosh, real fast. Real fast. Lightning round. Can a hurricane move from the west to the east? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to hear from you at 11 o'clock when the new data comes out from the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. That was fun. Thank you so much. And we'll check in with you then. Okay, thanks. All right. Gina or break? We'll be right back.